I am Mark Furry, I'm owner and brewer at Riot Beer and also a hop merchant at Africa Hops. This is our second episode of our video blog, aka vlog, and um, we're covering the four most important aspects of home brewing, which is 100% guaranteed to give you better results. All right, cool, let's get into it. Um, so we've got four major things that we're gonna cover off today. We've got water profile, brew house activities, hygiene and fermentation, and of course, packaging. Okay, water. So the golden nugget is do not use tap water. It's not good enough. Too much chlorine in there, um, not suitable for the job. So you've got a couple of choices. You either clear your profile down in the water so you actually start from a base which is neutral, or you adjust the water that you're getting from a spring, for example, in Cape Town, the Newland Spring. At Riot, we use a very humble RO machine, a reverse osmosis machine, to clear our water profile down to negligible. So therefore, there's almost no minerals in the water, and we have a base, a steady base, where we can build our water profile on. And from there, we're able to perform, or at least build any water profile for any type of beer we're looking to make. Basic water test is gonna help you out a lot. And you don't have to go and spend a whole lot of money on, on, on this. You can basically use your friend over here, which most households have. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you it is, but I think you know it is. So it's got a great chlorine test, great pH test, and a good alkalinity test, which brewers often ignore alkalinity. You need to make sure that you understand how this affects your beer, okay? So point number two uh, is probably the least important out of the, out of the things we're gonna to talk to, to you about today. Um, the brew house um, is all about extracting sugar and then obviously sanitizing your wort in the boil. Focus on quality sugar and, and, and good mashing techniques as opposed to trying to get good extraction and high volume in terms of sugar. This is it's more important that you make a great beer as opposed to lots of great beer. Leave that to the commercial brewer to worry about. Okay, on the boil, um, in the kettle, you, you need a, a good solid aggressive rolling ball. You can't be having a little simmer, it's not enough. Aggressive rolling ball is required. Uh, from a timing perspective, eh, anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes depending on your style. Personally for the Valve IPA at Riot Beer, we use a 90 minute boil. So, third point, hygiene and fermentation. So I've seen some people brew in this. I'm afraid to say that this is... <laughs> I broke that bucket. Completely unacceptable. <laughs> so what should we use? We could use something like this. It's a glass carboy. I think it is an acceptable fermentation vessel, but it doesn't give you a lot of control. Um, I think it's very entry level, and for probably less money or about the same, you can use something a little bit better. Let's check it out. A very, very simple plastic container with some key components. A tap at the bottom to allow tube and yeast to be racked off later on during the fermentation. And a nice little blower valve for any pressure. Of course this vessel needs to be clean, yeah? no doubt. I mean, you can use any sort of parasitic based uh, sanitizing solution and it can work well for you, all right? Scrub it down, clean it, make sure it's really, really clean before you put that beautiful cold, cooled wort into your fermenter and start fermentation. Okay, fermentation. So we're gonna get a little bit more technical now. So. Yes, you can get away with not pitching a uh, yeast slurry in. You can get away with just pitching in dry yeast. It might be a lesser beer, but you can get away with it. What you cannot get away with is a bad fermentation, okay? If you do not control the temperature of your fermentation, and I'm not talking about, hey, maybe I pitch it at 15 and then I'll finish it off at 24. I'm talking about accuracy in temperature. Each day, a specific temperature, all right? What we like to use at Riot when we produce the Valve IPA is a step fermentation profile. I'll come back to that in a second. So, homebrewers, I, I did it too. Um, homebrewers like to take that, uh, that wort and stick it underneath the, under the stairs and not think about it for two weeks. And every now and then you knock it out the park. You get a great beer that comes out of it because you were lucky, not because you have any consistency at all, okay? What you need to do is create consistency in your fermentations. And the way you do that is to control your temperature. And how you do that is you create something to control your temperature with. So you need a little temperature controller, such as an STC 1000, which you can get at any homebrew shop. 
Um, and then basically you need a little fridge, old abandoned fridge maybe that's still kind of working, kicking about in the garage. Convert this to control your temperature. This little switch thing, which we're gonna give you a little cutaway of now, basically allows you to switch your uh, fridge on, switch your fridge off, switch your fridge on, switch your fridge off, and eventually it equalizes out into the, into the temperature you're trying to get to. Okay, so our example for a fermentation profile is Riot's Valve IPA. Um, we're using your USO5, it's a nice, clean, easy, using, uh, easy to use yeast. Um, we pitch at 17 degrees in the fermenter, and we allow it to step up in temperature through its primary fermentation. So, we don't pitch at 15, we don't pitch at 19, we pitch at 17. Accuracy is important to start out the life of the yeast. So, 17, after 24 hours, we move it up to 18. After another 24 hours, we move it up to 19, and then we'll hold it there for two more days. So, after a period of five days, we will then move that uh, temperature on the controller up to 21 degrees, and for two days, we'll give it a diacetyl rest, and we'll allow it to finish its fermentation at 21 degrees. This gives you a nice, clean, um, crisp, dry beer, which is perfect for the IPA style. Okay, so for the final section, it's packaging. I'm not gonna harbor on this. Um, essentially, I'm just gonna give you a point of when I was a home brewer, I changed from uh, bottle conditioning to corny keg, and it just gave me so much more control. Bottle conditioning is challenging. It's an art of its, uh, on its own, essentially. It takes practice. Um, and the corny keg just gives you so much more control and it removes all those variables that can change on you. Really, uh, just be careful with the corny keg. Make sure that you understand how the thing works, that you don't blow it up in your face and that you know, it's a pressured, light, pressurized vessel and all that type of shit. Just be careful, all right? But it will remove those variables and it will give you more um, stable results. Okay, cool. Uh, we're pretty much done here for the day. Yeah, but you know, these, these, these points that we mentioned today are close to my heart. They, they definitely changed the, the end product of my home brews. Um, yeah, of course, there's, there's raw materials that you, you, can, you can have a look at, you know, what hops, what malt you're using, recipes, all the rest of it. These are all important things. They all add up to the final product. But these were the, some of the things that worked really well for me. Um, go and find your local homebrew shop. Um, I don't know all of them, um, but I hear there's a, a bunch of new ones uh, opening up which are exciting. So these are the homebrew shops that I know and trust. Uh, mainly because I know the folks there, all good people, very passionate about homebrewing and um, we'll be able to give you the advice you need. So go check them out. We'll see you on the 1st of April, which is April Fool's Day. Not sure how that's going to work. Uh, but anyway, that'll be episode 3 of our vlog. Um, keep it real. Cheers. Cheers.